Hello, my name is Dan Hampson. In this talk, I'm going to give you an overview of the theory behind LithoSI, a product that which we are about to release as part of our HRS9 suite. So, a new product will be released by Hampson Russell called LithoSI. LithoSI is used to predict lithology or classified well logs from pre-stack inversion attributes. This talk presents the theory behind LithoSI. This talk is entirely with PowerPoints. In an accompanying video, I'll show you how the program is used with a live demo, so I encourage you to have a look at that other video as well. Before talking about the theory of LithoSI, I'd like to present the background basic problem that LithoSI is thinking about. It's now routine to invert pre-stack seismic data. In that process, we transform angle gathers into elastic volumes like P impedance, shear impedance, and VPVS ratio. The challenge now is to relate the derived volumes back to the well logs in a meaningful and mathematical sense. So that's what LithoSI wants to do. One way we could approach this problem would be to create a cross plot of the inversion attributes using the logs themselves. So for example, if I did a pre-stack inversion and I had two volumes, one VPVS ratio and one P impedance, I could cross plot the well logs of those properties and it would look something like this. Then I could highlight particular zones, for example, where I think there's a gas sand and see it projected onto the well logs. And in fact, that highlighted and selected zone could be plotted on the inversion volume. This is a highly satisfying and elegant way to proceed, but the problem is that there's a certain arbitrariness associated with that zone that I've isolated. For example, if I happen to make the zone a little smaller, then that the corresponding region on the inversion result gets smaller as well. So that the interpreted area depends critically on the size of the zone. In fact, if I make the zone small enough, the interpreted uh, area could go away completely. Now this is not a satisfactory state of affairs. An alternative to defining an arbitrary sharp cutoff for the zone is to define a probability distribution. So instead of the arbitrary zone, we have a probability distribution. We could think of the zone as a type of distribution in which in fact the probability of being a gas sand anywhere within this rectangle is 1 or certainty, and it drops to precisely zero right on the edge. That's where the arbitrariness is. Instead, the probability distribution is a mathematical function which has a maximum centered on within the cluster of points and falls off gradually as we head farther away from them. That probability distribution can still be mapped to the inversion volume. Then we're using something called Bayesian classification. So the basic problem is how can we improve the cross-plot zone method? Four ideas come to mind. One is we would like to select multiple zones automatically using lithology logs. I'll explain in a minute what I mean by lithology logs. We would like to generate probability distributions for each zone. We would like to use cross-validation to check the zones with the seismic and see how well we're doing. And when applying to the volume, we're interested in calculating not only the best zone of the group, but also the probability or reliability associated with that calculation. So that's the problem that LithoSI attacks. LithoSI is the program that does species classification. For that process, we need a series of well log curves. For example, in each well, we need curves corresponding to the inversion outputs that we are analyzing. For example, P impedance and VPVS ratio. In addition, we require what's called a lithology log. A lithology log is a number-coded log which identifies zones within the, uh, well, uh, the curves themselves. Typically, the, the lithology log is created by a petrophysicist who's familiar with the area. From the well log data, we extract what's called the training data, which is basically a cross-plot color-coded by lithology. From that extracted data, we calculate probability distributions. Those distributions, if they are well separated, indicate a, a high ability to separate the two classes. Where they overlap, it shows non-uniqueness or difficulty, which is helped by the mathematical process. From the probability distributions, we calculate at every single point the probability of each of the classes. So for example, if I'm interested in the star point, the probability in oil of, and water are similar to each other because of the overlapping clouds, but the probability of gas is much lower. The mathematical tool which is used to calculate the probability distributions is Bayes' theorem. 
And this theorem calculates the probability we have a particular class given a particular set of seismic attributes. So on the left, P and C refer to the probability that C is a particular class. For example, sand. So I'm asking for what is the probability of sand given the value X, which is the seismic attributes. For example, some values of ZP and or VPVS ratio. On the right, we have three factors. The first one is what's called the a priori probability for sand. And this represents the likelihood of getting a gas sand independent of other information. And typically this is calculated by calculating how many samples there are in the original logs corresponding to that class, class compared to the others. Uh, the next factor is one that's very important and in fact is the one that's derived from the cross plot. It's called the probability density function. It's the probability of getting the seismic attributes if we happen to have that class. And I'll show you how that's calculated in a minute. And then in the denominator, we have a normalization constant. So how do we get the probability density function? Well, the way to think of the operation is to think of a, of a convolution of a mathematical function with the cross plot itself. So to make things simple, we've created a one-dimensional cross plot here where we are dealing with one attribute, say, ZP. We could think of this as turning the cross plot on its side and the other dimension is outside the plane of the paper. Uh, the probability density function is a smooth curve that mimics and measures the density of points in the cross plot. For example, where there's a high density of points, we get a large value. Where there's a low density of points, we get a low value. Mathematically, this is calculated by convolving a kernel, which is a function which looks something like a hill, whose width is set by the user parameter h. That h controls the smoothing of the distribution. A large value of h means wide, broad hills. Narrow value of h means narrow, sharp hills. To some extent, that's an arbitrary user parameter which has to be determined by trial and error. Looked at in two dimensions now, we get the what is more typical look of a cross plot. And we have on the vertical axis one of the seismic attributes, say VP over VS ratio. On the horizontal axis, the other one, ZP, and the cluster of points. Convolving with the two-dimensional kernel gives us a particular set of contours corresponding to the probability, uh, probability density function. Notice the tightness of these contours is controlled by the value of h. If I make the smoother larger, I get broader values. Typically, once again, h is a user parameter which must be set by a certain amount of trial and error, and we usually do this by looking at cross-validation results. In other words, finding which value of h is best at predicting unknown wells. When we put the three classes together, they pile on top of each other in a plot such as shown in the upper left. So now we have three classes and three curves. And this is the entire probability density function. The bottom left shows the, the result after normalization, which reflects the fact that the probability, in fact, has to be a number between 0 and 1 at every point in the uh, space. Now, how is this used? Well, uh, we have three classes, A, B, and C. And if we choose a particular point, say x1, then the, the probability of any given class is measured by the length of that color on that line. So there's the probability of class A, class B, and class C. And we can read the numbers off. And from this, we would conclude that for the attribute x1, the most likely class is C. It, win it wins, and it has a probability of 44%. By contrast, if we go to another point like x2, now the class B wins with a probability of 46% or 0.46, but it's only marginally better than class C. So this indicates that the information that we're getting is not only that B is the winner, but it barely beats out C, indicating there's lots of confusion at this point between classes B and C. In fact, sometimes uh, we choose not to make any estimate, not, not, a, not a value, because the value of the probability distribution function of the cross plot space has dropped so low that it's unreliable. One handy way of determining how well all this works is to create what's called a confusion matrix. The confusion matrix is commonly used for classification problems. Now this is an example to give you a, a feel for it thanks to Wikipedia, and it shows the result of a, an imaginary problem in which a computer uh, with a neural network was trained to recognize a cat, a dog, and a rabbit from a picture. And it, when it was given pictures, this 
matrix shows how well it did. So for example, the right answer is on the left-hand side here, and the estimated or guessed value by the computer is on the top. So for example, the way we understand this is that when it was shown a cat, it got a cat five times. But three times, it thought it was a dog. So there was some confusion between cat and dog. It never thought it was a rabbit. So it, in summary, the way we understand this is the diagonals show successful classification, but the off-diagonals show confusion. And we would conclude from this that this network is very good at telling a rabbit from anything else, but not so good at distinguishing dogs from cats. This process is also called a confidence matrix. A confidence matrix is the same thing, uh, just with a different terminology. So now we'll apply it to our lithologic case. So we have a lithology log, which is the right answer, the true answer shown here, and to the right, a classified trace from the litho-SI process. These are not identical because the thing never works perfectly. But we can uh, summarize how well it worked by the matrix shown on the right. So for example, if we count all the points where when it was a hydrocarbon sand, it got a hydrocarbon sand, 83% of the time it was right. HC sand, HC sand. By contrast, when it was a wet sand, it sometimes got it as a shale. And um, that 27% of the time could, may or may not be a problem depending on our situation. So in summary, we use the confidence matrix to summarize how well we can just, the system distinguishes the classes. So to summarize now, here's the way the litho -SI workflow goes. We need input data in the form of seismic outputs from pre-stack inversion. So it, typically they are things like P impedance and VPVS ratio volumes. They could also be Poisson's ratio or density or others. We also need a series of wells that tie the data, which contain curves corresponding to our inversion outputs, as well in each of the, of the wells we require a lithology curve, which has to be created somehow, typically by a petrophysicist. From the well log data, the program extracts a cross plot color-coded by classification. From the cross plot, cumulative multivariate probability density functions are created, which represent the mathematical measure of the overlap and the degree of separation between the classes. From these PDFs, the program extracts class probabilities. In other words, for every given point, say where the star is, it calculates the probability of each of the three classes. And when that's done over a large volume, we end up with volumes of are called litho cubes. Litho cubes are the probability of each of the classes throughout the space. So for example, if we have three classes, we'll get four litho cubes, one for each of the class, plus one probability for each of the class, plus one generating the uh, classification result itself. So in summary, a new product is about to be released by Hampson Russell called LithoSI. LithoSI is used to predict lithology or classified well logs from pre-stacked seismic inversion attributes. LithoSI will be released as part of the general HRS9 release. This talk has presented the theory behind LithoSI, and once, in a, once again I'll remind you that there is a, an accompanying video which shows the practice of using LithoSI within the HRS9 software with a live demo, and I would encourage you to look at that. Thank you very much for your attention.